Welcome to our virtual panel on radical movements in the village and the battle for reproductive rights. I am Juan Rivero, Special Projects Director at Village Preservation. Let me start with a few words of introduction. Village Preservation is a neighborhood preservation organization focused on Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo. Since 1980, we have been documenting and celebrating these neighborhoods, fighting to stop inappropriate development in them while encouraging appropriate development and advocating on behalf of their cultural institutions and independent small businesses. In addition, we host about 75 free programs per year, like this one. Our events cover a wide range of topics related to the history, architecture, culture, and development of our neighborhoods. You can still, for instance, catch a few pieces of the public art installation Village Voices, which was on display last month in two dozen scattered sites. You should check them out. They're great. And in a couple of weeks, in addition, we will be hosting a living history lunch chat with Luz Rodriguez, who helped found Sister Song, a women of color reproductive justice collective. You should check that out as well. We are a member-based organization, so your support is essential to our capacity to provide this free programming and continue our advocacy and preservation work. If you like what we do, consider joining us or making a donation at villagepreservation.org. Leanne is gonna be dropping the link on the, on the chat. Tonight, we are hosting another installment in our series on radical social movements in the village. Our distinguished panelists will be discussing the early struggles in the village to assert a right to reproductive choice. Over 100 years ago, socialistic concerns about the exploitation of poor women and the drive for greater sexual freedom and gender parity came together to fuel early campaigns for access to birth control information and reproductive rights. We will hear tonight about the intense political battles that followed and about the persistence of the issues that fuel them and that continue to animate activism and debate on reproductive rights even today. Hmm. I will now hand it over to the co-sponsor of our event, Amy Aronson, Chair of Fordham University's Department of Communications and Media Studies. She will introduce the speakers after which uh, we will move on to them uh, who will give presentations and we will then lead a discussion and Q&A session. <laughs> Depending on how we're doing with time and how many questions we have, we will either call on folks to post their questions directly, in which case you will be promoted as a panelist, or you we will instead relay your questions to the panelists ourselves. Just in case, I would encourage you to submit questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and you can do that at any point. You don't have to wait until the end of the presentations. And with that, I leave you with Amy Aronson. Thank you so much, Juan. Welcome, everyone. I am so proud to be here and so looking forward to the conversation this evening. It is my honor and privilege to introduce our panelists tonight, um, beginning with uh, Joanna Scutz who is a feminist cultural historian and literary critic uh, and was the inaugural Andrew W. Mellon postdoctoral fellow in women's history at the New York Historical Society. Her new book, Hotbed, Bohemian New York and the Secret Club that Sparked Modern Feminism, tells the story of the Greenwich Village Feminist Club heterodoxy and explores how its trailblazing members grappled with questions of bodily autonomy and sexuality, both as private matters of personal happiness and as public questions of laws and rights. Candace Falk is Emma Goldman's biographer uh, and also a documentary editor and director and a historian who received a Guggenheim Award for her scholarship and a Hamer Award from the Society of American Archivists for excellence in research and sharing of the 22,000 document archive microfilm edition of the Emma Goldman Papers. Now the Emma Goldman Papers uh, is uh, the Emma Goldman Papers Public History Project and it includes a traveling exhibition focusing on free speech and reproductive rights, a middle school curriculum that includes Goldman's impact on critical issues of her day, commemorative posters for classroom display, and more. When her book was first published, uh, The Guardian named Falk's multi-volume Goldman biography among its 10 best nonfiction works in history. 
Last but certainly not least, Alexander Sanger is the author of Beyond Choice, Reproductive Freedom in the 21st Century, and also the grandson of Margaret Sanger. An advocate for reproductive rights nationally and internationally for over half a century, he was the chief executive of Planned Parenthood of New York City with its large clinic and its education system. Witnessing firsthand the struggles of women and girls to plan their pregnancies and children, often without a male partner, he saw the need for political arguments that focus on real world issues that his parents, his patients faced. He sees the need to bring men along with arguments aligning them as supporters of women's reproductive freedom. It's a wonderful panel. Um, and now I'm going to uh, ask our panelists, uh, probably in that order, please, to begin their presentations. Joanna. Oh, I apologize for cutting in and out. My internet has been a little unstable, but I think uh, it's gonna work now. So I will get started. Um, my, let me uh, share my screen if I can do that. Uh, and I want to uh, share with you, um, essentially we, as uh, uh, as that lovely introduction um, had it, we, I, I, what I want to talk about is the ways in which um, in the village at, in the early 20th century, the causes that we think about as often historians think about and treat as separate uh, sort of social justice causes um, were so deeply linked by networks of personal connection and friendship and fellowship in the unique environment of the village. And my book, Hotbed, uh, which is sort of the illustration on the cover kind of gives you a sense of this um, sort of a, environment of a, a sort of casual fellowship. Um, and there are so many organizations that were vital to the way that this um, community was built. Uh, one of the ones that, um, it, the, the one that it's at the heart of my book, Heterodoxy, was a network of women that was somewhere between a sort of social club, a political discussion organization, a, a you know, an organizing hub, and also a somewhat of a professional networking group. It had, it, it carried out a many different um, organizations, but essentially what it did was bring together women who were sort of blazing a trail as feminists, as public feminists at the, in the early 20th century, popularizing this term. Um, the women in heterodoxy wrote essays and gave talks and sort of embodied for the American public, this new idea of a feminist, which was taking many of the uh, demands of suffragists that had become somewhat familiar uh, in, over the, the decades that that fight had been ongoing, and they were pushing much further, thinking about what women's roles in societies truly were, and what their potential could be, and how they could meet it. And reproductive rights in a sort of broad frame um, really was central to that question, the ability to sort of choose the direction of one's life as a sort of a right that women were trying to claim for themselves. So I want to talk just a little bit about the club, and then I will focus on Mary Ware Dennett, who in within heterodoxy was the most uh, prominent campaigner for birth control, uh, for the for the decriminalization of the the increased availability of contraception, and was a sometime collaborator and to some extent rival of Margaret Sanger's in that project in the village, but had some somewhat different ideas about the way that the focus the, the focus of a reproductive uh, sort of rights fight at the time should be. But I'll start by just giving a, a brief introduction to the club for those of you who are not familiar with it, although I know this audience is probably very aware with, of some of these names and certainly um, some part of the environment. This um, slide shows heterodoxy founder, Marie Jenny Howe, around about the time of her wedding. Uh, Marie Howe moved to New York in 1910 when she was 40 and started the club um, Heterodoxy 
a couple of years after she arrived, um, she had become active in the suffrage fight and she brought in most of the initial club members through her suffrage activities. But suffrage was by no means the extent or the limit of the um, of the goals and of the activities of the women in heterodoxy. So it's, I think, important to think about that, that baseline of organizing and activism that was very, the, the women in the club were very comfortable with and, and used to as a, um, as a new sort of way of being visible and, pre and, and sort of present in the streets. And then think about the ways those techniques were applied in other arenas because there's a lot of crossover of technique of you know of approach um and of people in so many of these interrelated social justice fights um i want to the the main piece of evidence about heterodoxy uh to speak about historiography for a moment is that or the the thing that makes it challenging to research this club is that they didn't keep a record of their meetings. So we don't have an archive that tells us precisely who belonged to the club, um, but we or exactly what they talked about at many meetings. And this has kind of made it a little bit of a, uh, just a sort of neglected historical um, moment. And so the thing that I found interesting, however, is how much evidence there is that the club was an important emotional bonding experience as well as a political activist experience for its members. Um, that also, I think, has tended to uh, turn historians off uh, from researching the club. The idea that the recollections of it are too effusive and too emotional to really be taken as evidence about what the club was and could do. And one of the main pieces of evidence is an album that was presented to Marie around uh, 1920. That was, I think, my supposition is that it was a 50th birthday gift. Um, her 50th birthday was at the end of 1920. But the album is this in remarkable document. The members of the club who were still there and, and were present in 1920, when the club had been around uh, for eight years, it contributed photographs and dedications that really give a flavor of who the women were in the group and um, and what the club meant to them. The I'll give you a flavor of a couple of these. Um, this is one of my favorite pages by Catherine Anthony, who's a feminist biographer, who writes uh, about the affectionate, uh, with these two photographs, um, the portrayal, as she puts it, the evolution of a butterfly into a chrysalis, um, the evolution of a woman, young woman, groomed for marriage and domesticity, and here pictured at her desk, surrounded by her books. Catherine Anthony was in a lifelong relationship with Elizabeth Irwin, who was the founder of the Little Red Schoolhouse in Greenwich Village, and the them were known and acknowledged as a part of the club. Um, and I want a place to think about reproductive rights is to think about how it connects, how these questions about personal development that Catherine Anthony's journey illustrates, how those things connect to the politics of feminism. So this slide you may, again, this is also something that uh, may have been seen by, by people in this group. It's a very, uh, it, it's a fascinating document um, for what happens when heterodoxy has been eating for about a couple of years, she probably less, we don't quite know when in 1912 they started meeting. <laughs> But they held, Marie Jenny Howe organized these two feminist mass meetings. This is a moment when the idea of feminism started to go really, truly public in the environment of the village at Cooper Union um, under the auspices of the People's Institute, which her husband, uh, Frederick Howe, was, was uh, running. 
And what I think is so interesting about these two meetings is they show us, the in the first instance, um, the idea that feminism is this personal, uh, ha has a sort of personal slant. We don't know what exactly was said in these speeches, although they were pieces of them, fragments of them were, were recorded in print. Uh, but the names of the participants are almost all heterodoxy members or the men they were married to or almost married, soon to be married to in, in a couple of cases. And the second meeting shows a slightly different approach, which is a series of rights that women were claiming, um, none of which are explicitly political rights, apart from the right to organize by Rose Schneiderman, who is a, a big um, a major figure in the um, Women's Trade Union League and in union organizing. But the, um, the other range of rights that are listed here imply a certain kind of control over a woman's personal life as well as professional life. And that I think is very interesting. The, the right to work, the right of the mother to her profession, um, all of these, uh, these kinds of rights are about what a family looks like and what a professional life looks like and how those things are going to be balanced. And this was increasingly a major question for heterodoxy members was how, how to limit families. And then also if one wanted children, how, to balance the care of children with the ability to do important and how to it was the heart about keeping one's name on marriage, which was uh, something that many of the heterodoxy women fought for. Uh, so those that this is sort of an introductory um, a sense of the ideas of some of the issues that beyond the vote that the women of heterodoxy were really taking on board and sort of pushing for the idea that women's roles could be public as well as private and how those were to be balanced and integrated was really a lifelong project uh, for so many of them. Um, and then I want to focus uh, briefly, turn briefly to uh, Mary where Dennett, who is a really interesting figure, who is actually, I think, the subject I know of at least two people who are working on biographies of her right now, which is a wonderful uh, indication that she's becoming a sort of a fascinating, you know, she's a figure that is having a, a more of a moment as, as several of the heterodoxy women are long overdue. And she is someone who, this is her picture in the album to Marie, here she is with her, her teens, her teenage sons, um, and this, this is her in 1919. Her sons, uh, she had uh, three children, one of whom was stillborn, and she had terrible uh, experiences with pregnancy and childbirth and was really, uh, had been in fact told that she shouldn't have children, uh, but was able to eventually give birth, but it was a deeply traumatic experience. She became very interested in um, the Twilight Sleep movement, which was a push at the time in this era, in this period to try to um, essentially to eliminate the pain of childbirth, but through extremely dangerous methods of uh, essentially drugging um, drugging the the women. Uh, she was, but her interest in sex and sexuality and um, birth control really came from. The, the sense that like having encounter, having understood at its deep and painful level that childbirth was was life threatening, uh, this was really something that I think pushed her to to really want to share not just um, sort of the means of birth control and contraception, but really the information that would mean that women and men could make informed decisions about it. And her approach um, in her activism around this issue um, was encapsulated, I think, in a, I wanna share with you the, um, the pamphlet that she wrote, 
She was eventually prosecuted for writing and distributing the pamphlet I'm going to show you, uh, but not until the late 1920s when she was actually a grandmother. But she was, when she was raising her children after her husband had left, she wanted to be able to speak to them about sex when they were teenage boys. And she was at a loss as to find any kind of you know, information that she could share with them that felt honest and accurate and not overlaid with emotion and uh, morality. So she wrote what she wanted as often happens. And she wrote a pamphlet um, that, that I'll share just a little bit of. It was mostly, it was a short pamphlet, but once it kind of got, got out, it became something that people were very interested in having her circulate and share because it does a really remarkable job of speaking to young people speaking to adolescents about their bodies in a very straightforward and honest way. Um, there's, I'll show you the, not safe for work illustrations, but the illustrations that she wanted, you know, the extremely, as she says, I believe we owe it to children to be specific if we talk about the subject at all. And here she has with these illustrations, carefully labeled and, you know, accurately delineated. She, the, the whole, uh, pamphlet is like this. There is a, a very detailed account of what happens during sex, and she emphasizes the pleasure of sex and the importance of enjoyment. Uh, there are certainly things that are very uh, that are dated and of their time, but I draw attention to it because I think it's really important to keep in mind when we think about these questions around reproductive rights. We tend to isolate certain aspects of the fight. And I think what is really interesting in looking at the heterodoxy women and the way that they approached these questions was the way that they saw reproductive rights and women's rights to choose what their families look like and how they wanted their lives to turn out as connected to these much larger and sort of questions that touched on all aspects of experience that has touched on education and child rearing as much and on the nature of marriage and the kind of partnerships that um, the couple should enter into, questions around how those, um, you know, how those questions were going to impact your life as it's lived over the whole, you know, the whole span of it. And I think that thinking about the ways in which reproductive rights and the right to choice and contraception as the main things that these feminists were preoccupied were about a woman larger right to choose and live that she wanted. So there are so many ways in which that resonates, I think, today, but I think it is definitely a uh, question in terms of the framing of these issues as to who gets to choose what your life looks like. And I think it's interesting to, to think about, you know, to just go back to this, these questions about what feminism means and the range of rights that women were claiming for themselves and the question about how the right to choose what shape your private life takes in your private family as just like a vital precursor to your ability to fulfill your potential in the wider world. So those are some of the uh, thoughts I would sort of begin with to open up the ways in which this, you know, how, how broad and diverse and, and sort of like vital these questions were um, at an intellectual and emotional level for the feminists uh, in my book and in the village. And certainly there are many more political fights and more specific um, you know, arguments and approaches, but those, you know, I think it's a nice way to sort of kick off to think about what we're, you know, to think about those broader questions that we're really addressing when we think about this topic. So I'm eager to hear from the other participants and, and we can uh, hopefully come back. And if people have questions, I'm happy to. To expand on this. Thank you so much, Joanna. Uh, Candice, could you 
pick up. Emma Goldman was the person who people thought they knew because she was so rabble rousing and so exciting and so confusing to a lot of people. Why would anybody do that? Why would she risk herself so often? And, uh, and she had a very wide uh, array of issues that she addressed. So some of them were it had nothing to do with uh, birth control. They had to do with um, free speech, about free education, education that was not, uh, you know, was not something that you had to memorize. Uh, in the 1890s, she was on a ship coming back from England, and she was able to get birth control uh, devices. And at that time, to have a birth control device was a very, very um, dangerous thing. And she took it, put it in her suitcase, um, and brought it back and uh, gave it to her friends and to her people, and felt that it was something that was very important for women's uh, freedom. And it was, she was sort of surprised that we didn't have that. She started to become a midwife. And being a midwife put her directly in touch with what, it, what the suffering of a woman would be if she had lots of children and uh, no money and no choice but to have children. And certainly once you have a child, you love them. And then there it is. So uh, by the time the birth control movement uh, became something, uh, she had already started to become a speaker. From whatever angle the question of birth control may be considered, it is the most dominant issue of modern times, and as such, it cannot be driven back by persecution, imprisonment, or a conspiracy of silence. Women need not always keep their mouths shut and their wombs open. I want to pet and humor you. I want to be a loving sweetheart. But when we are together, business, propaganda, so many things interfere. You are such a powerful creature, it is difficult to be a simple lover to you. Your passion is so strong, so glorious, that fate provides that I never can have enough. I will never acquiesce or submit to authority. Nor will I make peace with a system which degrades woman to a mere incubator and which fattens on her innocent victims. I now and here declare war upon this system and shall not rest until the path has been cleared for a free motherhood and a healthy, joyous, and happy childhood. Um, that's a good segue, uh, Alexander. Well, thank you. Um, my grandmother um, was not a villager by nature or geography. Um, but if the village is a village of ideas, then she most definitely was. Um, she visited often, befriended many, and had affairs with not a few. Uh, she marched to her own drummer. Uh, used the villagers when she needed to, attacked them often for vacillation and posing. She didn't care much for armchair radicals who did not join her in the barricades or in jail. Uh, this is my grandmother with my father uh, in 1908, living in the suburbs. When she moved to New York from the suburbs in late 1910, she lived in Harlem up on 135th Street only moving down to West 14th Street 
at the end of 1915. Does West 14th count as the village? Um, before then, in 1911, she had enrolled her eldest son, Stuart, my uncle, in the modern school of the Ferrer Center on East 12th Street. Uh, my, my uncle and his seven classmates pictured here were the first students of the modern school, which soon moved up to Lexington Avenue in Harlem. My father and my aunt also attended there. She would presumably drop off my, my uncle on her way to nursing on the Lower East Side and pick him up on the way home. She was a nurse all the way through her early radical years, seeing untold miseries on the Lower East Side, sickly children, overburdened mothers, stunted lives, botched abortions. What to do, she asked herself, other than apply unguents and bandages. Her radical activity started in the Harlem branch of the Socialist Party, courtesy of her husband, my grandfather, who was an official there and who ran for the city board of aldermen in the 1911 election on the Socialist Party ticket and lost. Writing for the socialist newspaper, the New York Call, her very first article on women's life in the slums appeared on the same day as the news of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, March 26, 1911, and was probably unread. Her article was about 20 pages back in the paper. Her later articles on the birds and the bees, literally, in the call, and then on human sex ed were read. Anthony Comstock read them and tried to suppress one of them on venereal disease, but he backed down. The Socialist Party, ever eager for members, hired my grandmother to enlist women to, and to organize strikes. Her first effort being the laundress strike in 1911, 1912, alongside the IWW's Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. You will see in the middle of that, if you can read it, my grandmother's name, along with Rose Schneiderman, whose name was mentioned uh, earlier in the Heterodoxy Club. It was Flynn, we think, who convinced Big Bill Haywood and Carlo Tresca to bring my grandmother to Lawrence, Massachusetts, to lead the children's crusade of starving workers' children from Lawrence to New York, which she did. And this was covered by the New York Times. Her testimony before Congress on the poor health of the children in Lawrence helped turn the tide of the strike uh, here she is, if the slide goes, that's the front page of the Washington Star. That's my grandmother, the middle of the photograph. And then we have a picture of her, the coverage of her testimony. And Mrs. Taft attended, she was in the front row, or heard my grandmother give uh, the horror stories about the children's health in Lawrence. And this led to um, a settlement of the strike favorable to the strikers. The success of the Lawrence strike led to the, one of the biggest flops in US labor history, the Patterson Silk Workers strike. And we can blame part of Greenwich Village for it. The strike 15 miles from Manhattan was virtually uncovered by the newspapers who favored industry and not labor. The IWW was leading the strike. It was relatively peaceful, only one death caused by the militia. The strikers were a mix of nationalities and sexes. The same strategy on children's exodus was tried, my grandmother leading children from Patterson uh, to New York City. It got very little coverage in the papers and little donations. Enter the Greenwich Villagers, Mabel Dodge and her lover Jack Reed concocted the idea with Big Bill Haywood of a pageant at Madison Square Garden to reenact the strike using real strikers from Patterson as the cast. Big Bill assented to the idea because he had no ideas left at that point. The executive committee of the Patterson Silk Workers Strike was created, six members, my grandmother being one of them, along with Mabel Dodge and Jack Reed. They met not in the village, but at my grandmother's Harlem apartment. It was great theater, no doubt. 
perhaps the greatest political theater in this country since the Boston Tea Party, Jack Reed directing it. But it was all show and no business. Virtually no funds were raised and the Patterson strike collapsed along with the IWW. Interestingly, a couple of weeks before this, the pageant in Patterson, Carlo Tresca got up before a meeting of female strikers and said in Italian, shorter hours at work, more hours at home, make more babies. The women in the hall gasped in disbelief. Big Bill Haywood, collared my grandmother, shoved her onto the stage to rescue the day. She gave a euphemistic lecture about hygiene. She didn't dare at that point to discuss birth control at public with police present, and she saved the day. She was not afraid to be arrested. In fact, at a corollary silk worker strike in Hazleton, Pennsylvania, a few weeks before, she had been twice arrested, including once for striking a police officer. Her loyalty to the working class and the needs, their needs was family-based, class-based, and medically based. She was shanty Irish from upstate New York. Her father, well, as the saying goes, if there was work on the bed, he would sleep on the floor. <laughs> she had an Irish comradeship with Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, a medical comradeship with former nurse midwife Emma Goldman. The influence of Goldman on my grandmother, which my grandmother did so much to hide or deny, cannot be denied. But how can a show have two stars? Mm -hmm. My grandmother said in her memoir, and I'm quoting, though I disliked her ideas and her methods, not true, I admired her. She was a spring house cleaning to the sloppy thinking of the average American. She also wrote, my grandmother wrote to Alexander Berkman, Emma's comrade, saying, quote, you almost made an anarchist of me. Well, they had. Though they had their class differences, Emma and Sasha having upbringings in Russia, quite different, but more prosperous, certainly than my grandmother's. Emma directed her newspaper, Mother Earth, to the intelligentsia. And Candace, you can comment on this later if I'm wrong, because that is, she said, where change happens. My grandmother directed her anarchist newspaper, The Woman Rebel, for the working classes. When it came time for my grandmother to emulate Goldman and start a newspaper, she convinced, as Goldman did, a lover to become its financial supporter. Margaret's was a Greenwich villager, John Rampampas, a tobacco importer who owned the Rabelais Press and who had been rejected as a lover by Mabel Dodge. But my grandmother didn't move to the village when starting this paper. She moved as far away as possible to Inwood in northern Manhattan, probably to save money. It was, make no doubt, an anarchist newspaper, not a birth control one. But the term birth control appeared for the first time in the third issue. She said in the opening of the first issue, why the woman rebel? because I believe that deep down in woman's nature lies slumbering the spirit of revolt, because I believe that woman is enslaved by the world machine, by sex conventions, by motherhood and its present necessary childbearing, by wage slavery, by middle-class morality, by customs, laws, and superstitions. It was written for the working class, written by a woman of that class. The lead article in the first issue was on the white slave trade, but she also took time in the first issue on the front page to attack the new feminists, i.e. the Greenwich villagers, as being way too respectable. Quote, a middle-class woman's movement, she called it. And she added, consideration of the working woman's freedom was ignored. Emma Goldman was there at the start in the first issue, contributing an article entitled Love and Marriage. And in a quote for free motherhood, Goldman said, and I'm quoting, woman no longer wants to be a party to the production of a race of sickly, feeble, decrepit, wretched human beings who would have neither the strength nor moral courage to throw off the yoke of poverty and slavery. Instead, she desires fewer and better children 
begotten and reared in love and through free choice, not by compulsion as marriage imposes. Is that eugenics? And in the second issue of the paper, my grandmother did Goldman one better. And I'm quoting, women and men of the working class are so drained and exhausted in health and energy by their work, poor food, and bad housing that it is impossible for them to give birth to healthy offspring, thus making them unfit. Can the working woman of this country be anything but unfit when at 10 and 12 years they are sent into mills and factories to work in unhealthy and insanitary dwellings? Statistics tell us that more than 150,000 children in this country under the five years of age die each year, the greatest number by being the offspring of working women. Eugenics and intersectionality. She defied the Comstock on other laws and was indicted for the woman rebel, mainly for mentioning the prevention of conception and birth control, but also for supporting assassination as a political tool. Her friend Alexander Berkman and Emma's friend hatched a plot to assassinate John D. Rockefeller Jr. in June 1914. Uh, but the bomb blew up on July 4th on the bombers a block away from the Ferrer Center. My grandmother wrote an editorial supporting the bombers. Greenwich villagers shied away from this brash law-breaking and violence. The heterodoxy club that she went to, to ask for support rebuffed her. Goldman and Berkman didn't. They supported her. But Max Eastman of the Masses, also who was speaker at the heterodoxy meeting that was shown earlier, urged her to plead guilty with the condition that she never mentioned birth control again. She refused. And she refused to hire a lawyer. She wanted theater. She wanted one headliner. She had learned from Emma Goldman. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexander. That was wonderful. Um, a reminder, if you have any questions, so please enter them into the Q&A uh, and we'll relay them. Uh, and I guess I'll, I'll get us started because there's something that I think has, Joanna disappeared. Let's give her a second to, to pop back up because this also touches on her presentation. Joanna, are you there? Can you hear us? I can, yes. Okay, sorry, you disappeared sorry first. Sorry about that. that no my, yeah, my, uh, my Wi-Fi is, I'm cutting out and I'm just, I'm burning my, my cell phone data for this, but it's fine. It seems to be working and holding, so that's good. So there, there is a theme that seems to run, to have run through all of your, your presentations about the, um, on the one hand, the intersection of reproductive rights with other aspects of your private sphere and then of your public sphere on the one hand. And on the other hand, the intersection of reproductive rights with other policy issues, uh, workers' rights, education, free speech. And so I'm wondering how diffuse this framing became and through what means it disseminated and, and what impact it had, whether this is something that persisted or whether it gave way to a more uh, siloed and, and singular policy focused approach to advancing reproductive rights. Is everyone on mute or was my question? Should I rephrase my question? I'm thinking. <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give it a start. You know, my grandmother, um, as was Emma Goldman, you know, they, they were nurses. Um, and that, that training never left my grandmother. And she made the strategic decision very early um, after being thrown in jail a couple of times uh, and for opening the first birth control clinic in the country, um, that she would try to align herself with the medical profession um, and kind of put the radical, the radical past with Emma Goldman and Sasha Berkman, put that aside 
and to try to disguise it and hide it, uh, though pretty much everyone knew about it. Um, and she became, you know, she focused on doctors. Um, and it, that strategy, the first court case uh, that supported birth control was when she appealed her uh, conviction for opening that clinic in 1916. Uh, and the, the, the case, her lawyer took it to the New York Court of Appeals, um, and they upheld her conviction, and she was put in jail for 30 days out in the Queens County uh, House of Detention. But the, the court opinion said that the Comstock Law, um, there was an exception to it that the court read in, saying the doctors could prescribe birth control uh, to preserve the health of the woman, the health of the mother. Um, and so if the doctor found any medical condition um, that, could, uh, that a pregnancy could lead to a danger for her, any condition, then that doctor could prescribe birth control. Well, that opened the barn door um, for birth control being, being legalized. And it, it was because she aligned herself with doctors and, and did, did so thereafter. It was a very conscious, a very conscious strategy on her part. Um, but she, she also spoke around the country at labor unions, women's unions, garment workers. Um, and she would go anywhere to give a speech, not just wealthy women, but she did plenty of that because she needed to raise a lot of money and did. Um, and she had to support her organization, Planned Parenthood, which she did. Um, so she, it was a broad-based movement and uh, she, she never forgot where she came from. Joanna, did you, uh, did you have uh, a comment on this? I mean, I think you, you made the observation, you, I think you um, anal analogize this uh, uh, intersection between reproductive rights uh, the, and the private sphere and the public sphere and uh, contemporary framings. Uh, could you elaborate on that, uh, on what you had in mind when you made that, that comment? I think that one of the things that continues to be a sort of a question about uh, when we talk about reproductive rights and specifically about access to contraception and abortion, that those things have, in a sense, the I, there's a sort of conviction, I think, that, that I think sort of going back to what, um, what we're tracing around Margaret Sanger and the in interest in medical, sort of having a sort of medical authority making the final call about, or making the call, that it, I think this was an effort to, uh, to sort of depoliticize the question to some extent, having an authority that couldn't be questioned, that sort of would be accepted. Uh, the, the, the challenge for me about the, the, what I think what ended up happening with that, the reliance on that is that it does end up forcing women it did end up forcing women to it, it sort of silenced the the rights argument the idea that women had a right to what happened to their body and could choose uh whether or not that 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 a contraception and abortion was a question of what a woman wanted for herself that became that that remains a very controversial that, you know, there, there are ways in which that framing is very vulnerable, has been vulnerable to attack, I would say, that the phrases like abortion on demand have, were, have been weaponized by abortion opponents to make it sound as though demanding women are just sort of doing this in a very thoughtless way or a selfish way, and that the neutral authority of doctors need to be brought in to make that, you know, to to sort of take the, you know, to, to make it a question about health as though health is somehow separable from politics and from the trajectory of a person's life. And I think that has been a challenge, uh, actually a, a damaging, ultimately a damaging way to go because I think even people who support abortion and contraception tend to still conjure these, uh, these specters of, thoughtless women who have you know who want to have sex without consequences or want to you know and the that is actually what we're talking about that actually women just as men 
do that we have a right to think about pleasure and to prioritize pleasure and not to have to apologize for that and I think in a way there has been a sort of this I I'm not being terribly clear I think but I I think that there has been a political like there was a political choice that was made in order to get to make abortion palatable to make it this purely medical question and unfortunately it's a very simple it the opposition is very simple and the support is very complicated because when you actually talk to doctors and nurses they will talk about you know abortion care is not one thing it is the whole part of the whole spectrum of women's health care and it needs if you take it out you actually put all women in danger it's it, it endangers so many people not just bad women <laughs> you know and so in a sense they part of the i think the effort to depoliticize by medicalizing is now something that we need to rethink because it clearly hasn't worked um, and it's become an you know in a, in a sense an argument that does go back to rights and that women as which is sort of where a lot of the heterodoxy uh, feminists were coming from is that this is about uh, who we are as human beings and if women are human beings it they they just you know we need to think about rights what are sort of human rights um not in the way you think of that phrase now but what are human rights in a in a sort of collective sense and not make all these exceptions for women based on sort of mythology and religion and things that are not that they're they're not necessarily relevant to how people think about their life and I, I anyways <laughs> no, let me let me let me add, let me pick up on something that both of you said so it sounds like mm -hmm. there was a, a deliberate choice although i guess in alexander's um answer you, you talked about how uh, margaret sanger would speak to all audiences nonetheless in concentrating on doctors and joanna in in this concerted effort to um to reduce the question of reproductive rights to a technical one, right, and, and resort to the authority of expertise, um, you are you are uh, uh, pushing aside all these other framings that seem to be present at that moment. The framing of reproductive rights as uh, a labor question, the framing of reproductive rights as uh, impinging on questions of education, the the question of reproductive rights as as an economic question, and so I'm wondering what happened to all those more expansive framings. Whether that is something that actually was pushed to the side for the sake of rendering the question of reproductive rights a technical one, or whether that is something that has persisted. I think it was expediency to a certain extent. I mean, the, when I was talking about Mary Ware Dennett, um, her voluntary parenthood league, her approach was in, she attempted to have the Constock laws overturned, or at least the part that prohibited the distribution of contraceptive information to have that overturned at a, a you know, at a federal level to have, a, she attempted to get a bill introduced that would rewrite or I'm not sure exactly of the details to hand but she was she was attempting to take it into a make it a political you know, overturn this these prohibitions instead of trying to work around them by saying that certain if it is if a doctor is just information it's not obscene and if a private individual is distributing this information then it is obscene what she was saying was what the, the problem is not who is doing it. The problem is the, uh, the definition of it as seen. And that is sort of where the, I think that's where it's sort of a bit of a split came in um, because of course this didn't get overturned. She couldn't find people to support the political, you know, the political move, the political push, even after Comstock dies in 1914 to, to push to eliminate that aspect of his laws those remained on the books but it's also this is a question about power and the men the doctors are overwhelmingly men at this time politicians are overwhelmingly men at this time this is when this becomes a question about 
I mean, as a, as a gendered question, the idea that men's that that male authority is neutral is a large part of the problem, um, and accepting that that is accepting that premise of neutrality is is kind of why we are, I think, where we are today. That we've pretended that this is about I don't know that this is about morality when it's about power. Can I jump in and ask a question about men since you raised that, Joanna, in a little bit of a different way? Um, and I guess this is also a question for you, Alexander. Um, you know, the question of, of men's stake in the contraceptive fight. Um, you know, it occurs to me all the time and historically it also occurred to me in some of my own research, um, you know, the ways that, you know, even in the most conservative contexts, that is to say within heterosexual marriage, um, you know, men, you know, have a stake, you know, in um, wanting to be able to plan the size of their families, um, even in the most traditional setup, right, when when men were the patriarchal bread earner, bread earners and, you know, off and, and expected to at least take the lead in that regard, um, even in working class families that, you know, there's there, there's something in it for them too, to be able to control family size, right, and 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 plan families. And I, I, I wonder. Um, I guess Alexander, you mentioned it, you know, in some of your um, materials and in your in your introduction. Maybe you could start us off in talking a little bit about that tradition and your grandmother's experience and moving into the present arguments. And I'd love to hear from you know all members of the panel. You know, thoughts about that. Well. Sure. Um, but my grandmother said uh, famously back in about 1951, she said, we're not going to get anywhere without the men. Um, and we, 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 I was referred to as the men. Um, and um, of course, the men were, you know, all nine judges in the Supreme Court in a row were men. Um, and parenthetically, the, the late... Uh, lamented row opinion of whatever its faults, the word doctor or physician appears in that opinion more than the word woman. Um, <laughs> talking about uh, what, what Joanna was saying about the medical medicalization of it um, yeah. had a real downside eventually. Um, uh, reproductive rights. The first word of that phrase is reproductive, reproduction. Um, and um, I, I have thought for a while that um, we needed an intelligent, thoughtful way to bring the arguments um, about wh what men want out of the battle of the sexes, because there is a battle of the sexes over reproduction and who controls it and power. It's definitely there. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the two quotes that I read from Emma Goldman um, and my grandmother from The Woman Rebel, talking about women and men being unable to give birth to healthy children that are going to survive um, and get to adulthood and in turn have children of their own. Um, the, the working women, poor women, um, minority women um, have a much harder road to get to that um, than middle class uh, women and white women. Um, and um, the, the whole class and racial aspect of this, we haven't really touched on yet. That could be another hour and a half program. Um, but I, I'll just re remind us that the, these laws, these Comstock laws on birth control and abortion came uh, into effect, were enacted because of the uh, Irish immigration to this country and the potato famine, including my grandmother's parents, um, the, the white Protestants fearing that they were going to be taken over by these fecund Irish coming over, um, having 10 and 12 children. Uh, my grandmother, my grandmother's mother had 11. Um, and this, this great replacement theory that we hear so much about today, that's not a new invention. Um, it started in the mid-19th century and probably even before that. Um, and so the, these historical patterns about male, male power and white male power um, are, are, have been here a long time. And I, I've always been of the opinion that the Comstock laws and anti-abortion laws are there to prevent 
white women from using them. But the white men want to force their white wives to have more children and to keep keep the power. And that that's the that's the dynamic, the racial dynamic, political dynamic I see in this country. Yes, the I mean that's a, such an interesting part about researching this is what you're talking about when you're talking about methods of contraception in this you know 50 years before the pill you're not talking you know you're obviously not talking about something that women something that's fail safe anyway and you're talking about things that rely on women's you know the diaphragms at this time and the you know, how they had to work and how complicated they how difficult it was to for women who didn't know how their bodies really worked and you so much of it as we've said is about education and figuring out also kind of questions about timing and your cycle and how, how does you know there are times when you can't get pregnant and men can always get women pregnant women can't always get men get pregnant and so it's a this very kind of so many of these methods are trial and error unless you know how you know the heterosexual reproduction works and so it was like i think that's so it's so interesting that even it, it's not this idea that you just give people the device and then they have access it's you have to give them the device and teach them how to use it and so there was so much this is why it's such a question as we know as we've said about about speech about education about language um you know that the that the clinic that Sanger has set up in 1916, that she's, you know, it's so much about having all the information in all these different languages. And she had her Yiddish translator there. And there's all this kind of, you know, so much of it is about making sure that you, you can fit, it's fitting people with diaphragms, but also then that they know how to use them long-term. So it's the, as another reason, I think where the emphasis on, the sort of technical medical aspects of this miss so much of the larger picture around just knowing not knowing what to do but also the idea that if you know what to do you do have some power that women women who know that they're that they're fertile for a certain numbers of days in the month have some more power over the outcome than women who just have no idea so those, you know, all of these, you know, it's so interesting, like kind of what these devices were, but also kind of how they were used. And th at the same time, the one that's everywhere is condoms. Like men can get contraceptive devices and know how to use them and have done since, you know, for centuries. The, the, there's ancient versions of condoms. The idea is very important. That it's just this question that you can't trust trust men to use them. You know, I it's sad to me that men don't resist that idea more that they're not trustworthy. But. Also, there's eugenics to take into consideration. We haven't really talked about it, but it's there's a fine line, and people have to be really careful not to sound like eugenicists. Although a lot of people who support birth control were. Could, could you talk about the, the factionalism within the reproductive rights movement? I mean, so much of the story that you tell is one of reaching uh, of a, a coalition building, right? You, you are uh, reaching out to uh, the, the labor movement. You are uh, uh, you know, reaching out to the professional class, the doctors. Uh, uh, but you also made reference to factionalism within the reproductive rights. Could you tell us what that was about? Is something that was alluded to and then just moved past? Yeah, very briefly. I mean, Sanger and, and Dennett worked together and then and then divided largely about their approach. Um, it's a division. Sometimes it's a division of approach and sometimes it's a division of these larger philosophical questions about what um, what it means to what reproductive rights means, what family planning, birth control, what, what these terms mean. Is it about women's freedom? Is it about uh, health? The that big, complicated, and very mainstream 
way of thinking at this time. And, you know, thinking about those different aspects and seeing one aspect, or if you're coming from a middle class background and thinking that this is something that's important for like women's self determination and the idea of women's individual lives. Those, I, I, so it, it's a question that's central, but it's very hard to. It, one of the the reason I think, as we've alluded to, that Sanger is so successful is she sort of isol she isolates this issue, and so as she finds a way to ice to say, you know, she's coming from all these other places, but she's sort of focuses on like, okay, we have to get this one thing done, and we have to find a way to make it. This is the crusade, and for a lot of other women, I think it just became part of the the divisions were about they had other that they wanted it to be part of other arguments or it was not the thing they didn't think that the you know the birth control was the central thing or could be lifted out and I get I, I perhaps I'm wrong and perhaps I'm exaggerating that difference but it seems that Sanger's success and the why she is the name that we know is because she was able to sort of commit single-mindedly and it, it's certainly true that she repudiated the heterodoxy women because they had these other fights and many of which she considered trivial as we saw in the, the women rebel but she didn't have but they sort of saw it as all part of the same fight that feminism incorporated all these things whereas she was saying no you have to focus which is very like actually like very like alice paul with the suffrage movement who is a similar kind of single-minded trailblazer who made a lot of enemies because she refused to bend or compromise on like getting the vote and that was the one thing so it's like i think it's maybe a larger question about activism is it more effective to you and fight for it and just go for it? the most important even if other people are disagreeing or if social reorganization that has to happen Thank you very much. I, I and I agree. I think that that's a that's a, a question that takes us beyond uh, <laughs> the issue of reproductive rights to to all kinds of policy issues that we I want to mobilize around. 